Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's NAC at Home program. My name is Nadine Heidinger and I'm the Director of Communications at the National Arts Club. For those of you who are not familiar with the National Arts Club, we are a 501c3 based in New York City with a mission to stimulate, foster and promote public interest in the arts. Annually, we host over 150 free programs, including exhibitions, theatrical and musical performances, lectures and readings. To find out more about the National Arts Club, you can visit us at nationalartsclub.org or you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's event, Conservation and Restoration of Greek Masterpieces at the Louvre in Paris. The program will feature Ludovic Logier, the National Heritage Curator in Charge of Greek Sculpture in the Department of Greek, Etruscan, and Roman Antiquities, and Anne Liege, conservator and sculpture, uh, res sculpture restorer specialized in inorganic porous materials. They will present the challenges of restoring ancient works of art, focusing on two of the Louvre's most iconic masterpieces. They will also discuss a significant Greek inscription that will be presented in the upcoming exhibition, Paris Athens, Birth of Modern Greece, 1675 to 1919, opening at the Louvre next fall. This program is part of a three-part series presented in partnership with American Friends of the Louvre. And thank you to everyone for making this event possible. Following the conversation will be a brief Q&A, so please feel free to use the Q&A function for any questions you might have. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Ludovic and Anne, please enjoy the program. Bonjour. Bonjour. Hello, Bonjour everyone. everyone. So it's always weird to talk to a screen, but uh, we guess that we, you are all around. Um, Anne Ligier and I we are very glad to try to present you uh, briefly um, three files um, that make clear that in a museum such as, such, such as the Louvre, uh, we deal or handle with a different aspect of conservation and uh, uh, curator, uh, basically. What you see on the screen on the left is one of our absolute masterpiece, well known in the world, world in all around the world, uh, the Wing Victory of Samothrace. Um, dealing with the restoration of such a piece is, of course, uh, a big task, and it does involve a big team uh, with a lot of issues at stake. Um, on the other hand, the um, at Athena, the palace of Velletri that you see in the middle used to be a masterpiece of the museum in the early 19th century. Uh, I must confess, this is not the case anymore nowadays. Uh, on the other hand, of course, we are still involved in improving the presentation of such a statue but we handle it in another way because it's not an international um, issue. And then on the right, you see, which seems to be a very poor material, but in fact, this is a very important is Greek inscription uh, with um, an heavy symbolic um, material or, or significance. Uh, we will go back to it uh, later on. Uh, and this one um, has been recently restored by Anne Léger for an exhibition. So this is another um, question to address. What do we do or what should we do for an exhibition, which is a different topic uh, compared to um, dealing with a full collection of a museum um, all the year long? Next slide, please. Well, to start with the wing victory of Samothrace, we should remember that Samothrace is not the name of the statue, it's not the name of the sculpture, this is the name of an island, an island in northern Greece, a very small one, basically a mountain on the sea. It's very impressive when you, when you arrive on the island, and on this island, there was a small sanctuary, very important during antiquity, um, a sanctuary dedicated to the great gods. They had so many names that the Greeks themselves summed, summed it up uh, as the great god, 
it was a mystery cult. So you get there to, to be initiated and to be protected during the war or during a storm on the sea by those great gods. So many people um, gave offerings uh, to thank the gods. It could be a simple hook if you were if you were a fisher, or it could be a monument if you were a major power uh, during this time, or for instance, uh, a king of Macedonia. What you see uh, on the right below, this is the plan of the sanctuary. And um, just here was the place where the statue has been found. Next slide, please. And what it is very important to understand is the fact that you see a little drawing on the left. This is what you, what was what what was meant during the antiquity, and what you see all over the slide is what was found. Um, the excavation took place in 1863. Charles Champoiseau, a French uh, diplomat, consul was um, was uh, organiz organizing this uh, excavation basically because he was not very busy in Antinopolis where he was working for France. He, he got bored and he decided to do that. So he got um, an authorization uh, by the Ottoman Empire. But this is what, what he found it. Pieces and pieces, fragments and fragments. Um, hundreds of fragments actually for the statue itself. And what you see below, this is the base of the monument because actually this is not a statue, this is a full monument. And, and the base itself in the shape of a ship is made of 23 blocks. We will talk about it later on. Next slide, please. So during the 19th century, when all those fragments and blocks arrived in Paris, the curators um, had to find a solution to present correctly the monument. First, they had to understand it as a full monument, and then they, have, they had to restore it. And the head curator of um, the Greek and Roman department, my very, very early predecessor, um, Félix Raveson Molien, worked with his own son to, um, to, um, to find out a way to put all those fragments together using plaster for the missing parts. And what you see on the left uh, in yellow, this is what the two, the father and the son, invented themselves because there, there were those missing parts. Basically, um, the left breast and the right wing. So they, in a way, they invented the silhouette that is so well known nowadays. And we can assume the fact that the Wing Victory of Samothrace is a masterpiece of Hellenistic sculpture dating to the second century BC, but also kind of a masterpiece of the late 19th century uh, invented in, in Paris. So on the right, what you see is the result with little uh, differences compared to nowadays, because it was the very first presentation of, of the monument itself. And this is the moment when, um, when the statue became famous. Next slide, please. Yes. And here you see the, the full monument as it was in uh, 2012. And as you see, um, everything is basically gray or brownish. And you cannot realize that the statue is made of white Parian marble, the finest one in, in the Greek world. And the base in the shape of a ship, of a battleship to be precise, is made of Lartian marble from the island of Rhodes, um, which is a gray marble with white rosish veins. It was not visible anymore. It was not possible to see it. Plus, between the statue and the base itself, you can see a block, a modern block that had been added 
in the in the 30s and the 20th century in uh, 1933 because during this period of time uh, Etienne Michon another curator of the Louvre thought that there was a missing part and that this block should be meaningful uh, then he understood but it was too late that it was a mistake and this modern block stayed, stayed there so it was an issue at stake when we started the new conservation program to deal with this ugly blood block. So the thing is that when you restore a, a monument like that, you cannot handle it on your own. So here you see the team involved. Um, so 10 conservators, um, an architect, a mounting maker, a scenograph, and so on, and an inter international committee, because you cannot decide yourself. So many French colleagues, but also Greek colleagues, of course, and German colleagues, because you always need a German colleague in a committee to make it serious. Uh, but no joke also, uh, because he was a, a, tremendous, a tremendously efficient colleague, uh, the Professor Scholl, and also Bona Westcott, uh, our dear uh, colleague Bona Westcott, an American fellow, because she's the director of the American uh, archaeological uh, mission in Samothrace, and she has, of course, a very good knowledge of any kind of issue that you could address concerning Samothrace and the sculpture found in Samothrace. So, as you see, this is a this is a, a team thing. And um, the conservators has to deal with uh, many, many, many options and many advices. Uh, next slide, please. When you start such a program, you, you don't start right away. Uh, you do not clean right away the statue or the monument. Uh, of course, you make some uh, exams, examinations, to know where you're going to put your hands, basically to make sure that you do not do any mistakes. So here you can see the X-ray of the wing because uh, Anne and Daniel Ibled, uh, to quote them, uh, wished they could know what was the structure inside, inside the wing, the antique and original wing made of many, many fragments to make sure that they would apply the right treatment without uh, put the wing uh, in danger. Next uh, slide, please. And here, this is a uvelite uh, photograph. And you can see a mapping of all the, um, um, the treatment made previously during the 19th century, during the two uh, restorations of the 19th century, and probably the one during the 30s of the 20th century. And uh, as you see in the... Um, uh, light colors, there, um, there are a lot of um, in paints, in paintings, modern in paintings, because it, it was common when you wanted to adjust the plaster part, um, the plaster uh, additions and the original part to basically paint on the statue. Nowadays, we do not do it in the same way but uh, it was absolutely uh, common and uh, accepted during the 19th and the early 20th century. So here you have this mapping and it is very important to get it, to know how you're gonna handle the cleaning and Anne uh, watch it very carefully to plan everything she should do with her team. Uh, next slide, please. And in the meantime, during this period of exam, uh, exams, uh, examination, sorry, that uh, lasted for one full month, days and nights, basically, um, it was the opportunity to, um, to better understand uh, some other aspect of the statue. <laughs> we know that all the Greek statues used to be uh, colored and painting du during the antiquity. Um, this is not... Um, um, a scoop. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's not brand new to, to, to say that. But there was no proof concerning the wing victory itself. So we used um, um, 
a special device. We invited a colleague called Giovanni Veri. He came from London for two days and nights. And uh, we use this uh, visible induced luminescence uh, imaging that can spot the blue pigments that are not possible to, uh, to spot uh, with uh, natural light. And here you can see how it appears in, um, in very uh, bright uh, white in this area which is here at the bottom of the mantle. So we could understand that the statue was painted partly in blue, especially a band uh, underlying the rhythm of the mantle itself, and it should have been very beautiful. Um, so for the cleaning, it was also very important to make sure that even though it's not visible, it's not possible to see it, um, we, we could keep these uh, pigments, these uh, anti-colors, and uh, we made many tests, and uh, Anne was, of course, very careful with that. Next slide, please. And Anne, you can... So, yeah. um, uh, after all those um, examination, as uh, Ludovic just explained, we started to do some uh, tests for the cleaning. Um, as he said, there were lots of uh, former in conservation work that um, that have been that are, that darkened the statue, the surface of the statue, because what they used was not aging the same way as the marble. So everything was brownish, um, including and then including the marble because of the soiling of the of the surface of the of the stone. Um, so we started the cleaning. You have one of my colleagues, Pascal Klein, here, who is uh, working on the um, on the plaster uh, in fillings that were put on the statue in the 19th century. Um, and what you can see too on this slide is that the, um, as you can imagine, it's not easy to <clears throat> to take your statue out of the museum. So for the all this conservation treatment that lasted for a year. Um, a, a room in the an exhibition room was um, was uh, was used for us uh, for doing the conservation treatment, and we also got some special scaffoldings just to be able to work on all the height of the of the statue. Next slide, please. Uh, so here you see the statue uh, after uh, cleaning. Um, so you can see that now the marble has its uh, real color, uh, marble from Pajos. Uh, um, and, um, um, and also um, before, uh, on the other, uh, at the beginning of the, the talk, Ludovic showed you that the statue was on the base. Um, and this was also holding the statue on the boat, on the ship. And, um, and and um, so in order just to, to take this piece of uh, stone out and which was not accurate, we, we, the mount maker made a new mountain which, was, which is now inside the boat because now the statue is the exact place on inside the, um, the, big, um, the, the big pieces of the boat. As, mm. as Ludovic said, the boat is made of 23 pieces of stone, which are, which weigh between 800 and um, 1.2 tons, 800 kilos and 1.2 tons. And, um, and so, but the statue has its own place inside uh, of those blocks. And so um, we could, with, with Ludovic and all the curators and all the conservation and all the scientific um, uh, advisors, uh, we were able just to find the, the, the real place of the statue on the boat and to, to show. So we, we made we were this uh, iron structure so it could uh, be put on, on the top of the boat again. No, yes. Ne next, next one. Next yeah, one, next please. Time. Yes, um, this, is a, this, this is another aspect of this conservation program. 
Uh, as I told you, in the 19th century, in 1863-64, many fragments uh, were sent to Paris, uh, hundreds. And actually, in our storerooms, we keep a bunch of them um, as a puzzling uh, a group of fragments, as you see here. So. Um, I, I asked our team, uh, our services to put a, 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 a full a furniture, a big furniture <laughs> in the uh, conservation area so that I could have all those fragments on hand and uh, to look at it with, uh, with Anne and the other uh, conservators so that maybe we could ma make some new join uh, new discoveries. Uh, next slide, please. And here is a feather that was uh, very uh, um, telling for me because it was a very nice one and it, it, had, uh, it has a special uh, shape. And at some point I could realize that I could find, I could find the counter shape or the equal shape at the top of the wing and uh, after jumping everywhere because I was so excited, I understood that it was a piece made separately and Anne was there and she told me, I remember, hold on, um, there is some plaster at the top of the wing, I'm, I'm going to use my tools to inquire and she found the little hole, the little antique hole uh, to, to install and to fix the feather itself. So it was a teamwork. It, it was teamwork, and uh, we got we got the we got the ID, and uh, we presented it in front of the international committee, and everybody agreed that it, it was um, the right thing to do to put the feather back on the wing. Next slide, please. Because, well, we could have talked about it right from the beginning. What when it when we deal with such a masterpiece, you could change detail. I mean, this is a statue that had been reinvented in the late 19th century, but it's so well known that you keep the silhouette the same, that you do not change um, the shape of the statue, otherwise people would be lost or maybe uh, disappointed, not to say upset. Um, but when you can get such an improvement, uh, in, in a way, you have to, to make up your mind and to decide to do it. And here you can see the wing without the feather, and then with the extra feather that was there during the antiquity, that changes the rhythm a little bit, but I find it maybe uh, uh, more appealing in a way, I mean, for an antiquarian. Um, or uh, historian, so it was for us a, a good improvement. But Anne, if you want to add something, yeah, I, I just I chat that uh, the other interesting thing, other interesting thing was um, that the feather was meant to be put was was done was made uh, separately, separately, and mm -hmm. then it was meant to be put on the wing. So, and it, this was a very great moment when we found the hole, the antique hole, where we could, we could attach the, this feather on the, on the left wing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, beside all the conservation treatment, that cleaning and everything, all this information um, was um, uh, put to light again, because all this, the work that has been done on the statue. Really. Yeah. And actually we made also three other joints, we just, choose to show you this one because this is the most impressive, but uh, with Anne, we, we found also, and the Violent Pia, if mm. I remember well, yeah. uh, three uh, pieces of uh, drapery that we could, little ones, but important for us, that we could add on the statue itself. Uh, next slide, please. And here is the same puzzle, but with fragments coming from the boat, Part of them are in our storeroom in Paris, and part of them have been found in the 20th century in Samothrace and are kept by the American mission on Samothrace in the Little Archaeological Museum 
uh, on site. So here you can see us with Bona Westcott uh, working on those fragments uh, to understand where they could fit. Next slide, please. And here is a mapping of all the 19 fragments housed in Paris or in Summer Trace that we could put again on, on the boat itself, on the base of the, of the monument. The red one are the one in France, I was in France previously, and the blue one are kept in Greece and we got some copy thanks to the Greek government to put the copy on, uh, on the monument itself. Next slide, please. So here we go, this is before and after. As you see first, this terrible block, which was there only between 1933 and 2013 disappeared and the monument go, goes back to his real meaning. The goddess Victory or Nikki for the Greeks landing on the fighting deck of a battle uh, ship uh, and the mount is now inside because there is a missing block that is very useful for us as a loss for once. Uh, that could um, make possible that the, this uh, modern mount is now inside the structure itself. And most of all, you can see the difference between the Parian marble, also with its aging. We didn't clean everything so that it could, it, it would seem brand new. Um, you have also, of course, the patina and the age of the monument, but you can realize at least that it is Parian white marble contrasting with a Lartian gray, rosish uh, marble. And would you like to add something? Yeah, I want to just to speak about the infillings uh, mm -hmm. on, the, on the picture of the before the conservation treatment. You can see that you have gaps that were filled with plaster, but then you don't, you cannot follow the line of, of the top of the, the boat um and so it seems that there were only blocks put together and sometimes it was kind of especially when it was very dirty it was kind of hard to, it was a little bit hard to understand and so um, um of course we dismantled all the blocks of the boats uh, and then we we took all those plaster in finings off um, and then when we put all the, it was done by, mostly by Daniel Ibled, um, Benoit Lafay and Nathalie Bruyère. So when they were put back together, uh, we decided that um, for the new infillings that we would do, we would just um, add the line that was missing. So you can, you can have a clear, um, a clear view of the boat and of its lines. And also, but then when you come very close to the boat, you can you can still see the difference between the marble, the antique marble, and the infinings that we've done. So just to to have a better view uh, of the of the old monuments, um, we also changed um, the way to make the, the infinings. Yes. So this is a result of this conservation campaign that lasted. Uh one year, but we took five years to actually to prepare it. Um, we hope that you enjoy the result. Uh, everyone's taste is of course uh, understandable, but at least we, we had a great deal of pleasure to do that. And we understood a, a great deal of new data. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, no. yes, just for the pleasure, I forgot this one, the statue itself so that you can appreciate it uh, closer. Next, please. Yeah, I turn, uh, we switch to another topic quickly, just to compare. Uh, palace, which means Athena, uh, the Palace of Velletri is a monumental statue that has been found in Velletri, southern Rome, uh, at the end of the 18th century in 1797. Um, and the statue was very disputed between uh, many owners and a sculptor who was also a um, conservator, uh, Vincenzo Pacetti. 
finally, Vincenzo Pacelli got it, restored it. Uh, we uh, invented and carved all the missing parts, and he puts it. Uh, he put it on the market. But during this period of time, uh, Napoleon Bonaparte was uh, very efficient, to say it uh, in such a way, in the area. And he decided that the statue would, should come to um, Paris, which did not uh, happen right away because of the different wars in Italy. And finally, the statue has been exchanged and bought and we bought so that uh, Napoleon Bonaparte could get it. And it arrived in Paris in uh, 1803. Next slide, please. Yes. And um, Napoleon himself and Josephine went to the Louvre to admire it. It was pretty seldom that the two of them uh, did that. So it was uh, absolutely an event. And the, 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 the medal that you see on the left was issued especially on the order of Napoleon Bonaparte to commemorate the um, edition or the issue of uh, the civil uh, code, which is basically uh, our common law even nowadays in France and had inspired many uh, uh, civil codes in Europe especially in Germany. And um, it's, it's a, this is the meaning of the statue in the 19th century. This is Athena or Pallas, the um, goddess of uh, wisdom, but also of war. So this is to say that France was wise and powerful in the same time, which was maybe not true, but this is what Napoleon thought. And um, the statue was extremely famous during this period of time. And even in the beginning of the 20th century, as you see on the right, the staff of the Louvre was very proud to strike the pose in front of it. But um, later on, because probably because of all this avant-garde in Paris, this very classical statue, this very academic statue faded away a little bit. And, the Venus de Milo and the Wing Victoria of Savoie uh, definitely took the place. Next one, please. So here, uh, when we decided last year to, to restore this piece, um, it was of course an important task, but it was not the same issue at stake because um, we were dealing with a forgo um, forgotten uh, diva, I would say. So uh, we made the decision between uh, Ad, Anne and I, basically. But, um, and I tell it to be honest, but of course we applied the same type of uh, procedure and uh, exams, examinations and so on that um, we told you about concerning the wing victory of Samotrace. And here you can see the statue before fragment, before treatment with especially this weird color on the eyes and, and the lips um, that is dark and that is spreading over uh, as if she put her nose in a chocolate pot, actually. And there was an, a very important question. Was it antique? Uh, we knew that in the night, during the 19th, um, there was um, a, examination campaign that concluded um, it, uh, the, the material was partly uh, barium uh, sulfate, which is actually a modern material. So at least part of those colors uh, were, uh, are modern. Then uh, we had to inquire a little bit more. Next slide, please. So as we did for the wing victory of cemeteries, uh, we did some um, ultraviolet light um, uh, examination. Um, so in the middle, you see the statue with the, the brown lips, the brown eyes, and, um, and the, uh, under the UV light, uh, it gives, you can still see, see, of course, this very brown 
uh, color, but you can see that it's very um, defined around on 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 the eye on one side and on the other side you can see also thanks to the UV light that there were some infillings that were done on the left eye um, and that there was some piece some place where it was brown some places where it was violet um, so beside that they that during uh, some scientific examination they found some uh, bi biome sulfate um, we also know that this statue, this marble statue, was cast um, some some time in the uh, in end of the 18th century or beginning many of 19th. Times. So and was cast many times. And we also think that this all this brownish color on the face um, is some um, some product that was put on the face to be able to remove the cast uh, after they made it. Um, so this is not antique, um, but we don't know exactly when it was made, but this is not antique. And so we had, I had to find with my two other colleagues that work with me, one Nathalie Bruyere and Julie Moore, um, we had to find some, a way just to make it look better because uh, as Ludovic says, it seems that she ate too much chocolate. Yes. The same time. <laughs> So what you do in such case is that you keep what you see on the screen uh, because maybe later on um, our followers could have other ideas. Uh, you basically you do not work only for your time. If we are able to comment what our predecessor did in the 19th century, like Félix Ravé Saint-Molien for the Wing Victory or Etienne Michon for the same statue. It's going to be true for in two centuries for us. So we have to record everything and we have to keep wh what we can when we are not sure. We know that it's not antique, but we are not 100% sure of what it is, mm -hmm. actually. So the idea was to, to put some. Yes, yes some watercolor on it, but we're going to see it later on. Uh, next, please. Um, so, yeah, as you can, uh, the statue was um, was dirty to the marble. The surface of the marble was uh, dirty. So uh, we started some some cleaning, and the cleaning was made with a with a past uh, of paper pulp and water and some carboxymethyl cellulose, which is sort of a glue but very uh, little part of the, of the glue and the paper pulp and the water. And it's put on the surface on the, of the marble. And then it's uh, wrapped with uh, aluminum foil and it's left on the statue, on the surface of the statue for one or two hours. So th this past um, water-based past uh, can melt the dirt. And then we can just take the dirt off with uh, some uh, sponges. And here you can see the statue uh, and the mid treatment so the bottom part of the of the statue has been cleaned but the top part uh, ab above the um, the waist hasn't been cleaned maybe maybe those two uh, have been cleaned but the rest of it hasn't been cleaned so you can see the difference of the marble color and also what you can see is that why cleaning um you see some old infinings that became dark and uh, after, I mean, with the time. Um, and so this is something that we have to deal with uh, during the conservation treatment. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. Should we? Mm -hmm. And so after the statue has been cleaned, so you can see those dark lines that are, so you have several pieces of marble that were glued together. And in between the joints, they put some infinings that um, became dark after um, aging, basically. After, uh, aging, yeah. Be and then, so the idea was to take off all those uh, brown material because we know that this is for sure uh, modern material, and um, and uh, we replaced it with some uh, very fine mar marble powder and some uh, well, I think some um, glue uh, that is known to be uh, stable. And so now you can see the difference. And also because before, even if the statue was cleaned, 
this is kind of shocking when you see the, the, the statue and then now you have a better view of all the drapery uh, and, uh, and this day drapery is especially wonderful for this palace of vanity. Next slide, please. Um, yes, and well, everything was about um, graphic patterns, uh, rhythm and, and drapery because this statue made probably during the first or the second century AC um, is the Roman was the Roman copy of uh, classical Greek bronze uh, created during the fifth century BC. And um, we, to sum up by the school of Phidias and especially by Cresilas. And this is a period of time when drapery has to be very uh, readable. The rhythm has to be very clear. This is basically the classical style. So all this drapery and, 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 and foldings Anne is talking about um, were much better, uh, much better uh, uh, pre presented or readable uh, when the infills were renewed. But in some areas, um, the 18th century um, complements disappeared with time. What we call this is what we call tasselli, little piece of marble created by Vincenzo, Vince, Vincenzo Pacetti, sorry, as it was um, the tradition to do it, to complete the actual uh, shape of every uh, folding. So what you can do nowadays is just to assume the fact that um, those tasselli. Um, have been made in the 18th century. They are not there anymore because of because the statue traveled because that's been you know it had a long long um, story, and you, you you keep it like this, or you can do it again. Most of the time nowadays we do not do it again, mm -hmm. but this statue was so famous in the 19th century as a, an emblem of classical style with a political background, actually, as I told you, I thought to myself, and I talked, of, of course, about it with uh, many of my colleagues, it would be, in this case, accurate to recreate this tasselli. And this was one of the final tasks for Anne and uh, Nathalie Bruyère to create those tasselli to give back this sense of rhythm and parallel lines so graphic that are actually a very classical pattern. So yeah, so in all the missing parts, like in here, um, we used again some, uh, uh, so the idea of a conservation treatment is that it should be reversible, that it should be taken uh, off as very easily and that it won't arm at, at all the, the, the surface of the, of the marble. So to, to make new tessellae, we use some um, marble powder with some uh, glue. And then um, we first we use some coarse marble powder with the glue. And then we went finer and finer to, uh, to, to imitate the same um, granulometry that the one of the, of the marble of the, uh, Tazos marble, uh, that, Tazos marble. Uh, which in which this statue is made. So this was um, this was a task that is not very usual, but it was very interesting to do because then you can you can really understand how the sculpture uh, made the statue and uh, and all the rhythm that he wanted to give it to give to the statue. And if in one century uh, someone think well. Mm. Anne and Ludovic went crazy. It's very easy to remove it. Mm. As, Anne, as Anne told you, reversibility of, conserv of conservation is a major point. So nowadays, when you do something, you make sure that it can be undone, at least for this type of intervention. Next slide, please. So basically, this is before and after. And uh, so um, yeah, so as you see, on for the for the, the face, 
um, even when we cleaned it, um, this brownish color on the lips and on the eyes didn't disappear. So as, in, as Ludovic said, uh, maybe in some centuries that we'll have, that we know what it is or that we understand it better than we did. So the only thing that, because this brownish uh, colors just um, gives kind of a wrong, a wrong idea of the statue. So it was just in painted. The, I used some watercolor on the top, I mean, on the eyes and on the lips. So it would look like the marble, like the, the, the Tazos marble again. And, um, and when you see the statue, you can see it uh, in its um, completeness. And because before you would, you would especially be um, both out yeah of, for you, you 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 would be focused on the on the on those on weird the face, yeah. on, on the on, on the face spots. and then weird color and this is always the same um so you can remove this of, of course, course watercolors it's very easy to remove and when you get close to the statue you can understand that there is this weird color but from yeah. a general point of view you can forget it so it's not hired it's um, it's less visible so that you can appreciate, appreciate the statue as a whole and as a classical uh, project during antiquity. Next slide, please. Um, here you can see the mapping of the modern and the antique part of the statue that has been restored, has been restored by Vincenzo Pacetti. And uh, I had many questions, and uh, Anne provides many answers. And of course, sometimes we were looking at it together. But Anne, if you if you like, so you can see that the the right the, the right hand and the big and the wrist, the, and it's clean, it's green. It's not because there is a glove on the top of it. It's hmm. just because uh, it's a it's a modern one. It was made by uh, Vincenzo Pacetti, and then also. Um, uh, you can see that on the left end, you have lots of pieces of marble. And um, in between, there was, there was some plaster, um, or there was kind of a, a, a natural resins between. So depending on, on the fragments, it was not glued the same way. And also, the, what the cleaning told us is that uh, all those pieces of marble are not the same. So you had some pieces that are new one, modern ones from the 19th century. And then you also have pieces of Tazos marble that may have been from the statue. And you have pieces of Tazos marble that were that are from Tazos, but maybe didn't belong to a statue or were, or were worked on again, or they were just reused. Reused. This I can explain quickly, mm. shortly. Uh, during the 18th, the 17th and the 18th century, actually, um, Rest, um, conservator were also uh, sculptors and, and, and very talented. So what they did, they used modern marble to complete the losses. But sometimes when they wanted um, the result to be very uh, efficient, uh, as, as an illusion, they could pick up some marble from the bottom of the statue, from the plinth, for instance, or from the back. And they could use the very same material uh, to make a thumb, to make a toe, to make a nose, to make a leap. And in this case, what was very interesting, and Anne um, made a great deal of observation to, to help me to understand, is that we could map a different marble or antique marble recut but during the 18th century so it's puzzling it's a puzzle but this is to underline the fact that when you restore such a, a statue which is a forgotten um, masterpiece of, of the museum of course you understand a great deal of new data and this mapping wouldn't have been possible at all before before the cleaning and the moment when you open the infills and you can understand in a better way what you have in front of your eyes. Uh, next one, please. Ah, that was the end of it. Uh, but um, 
because um, time is running fast. I, I won't comment anymore the Palace de Pedetri. Just to say very quickly that we are trying to organize an exhibition uh, during fall that was planned during spring, and we'll see if we can achieve anything anyway. Uh, this is an exhibition dealing with, uh, with the relationship between Greece and France during the 19th century and this very important moment when the modern nation of Greece re reversed and how France was helping, but also as how France was feeded by Greece, of course, as a reference. And uh, in the context of this exhibition, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna put on show many antique statues, of course, some from our collection, some from Greece and elsewhere. And we pick up one especially, next slide, please. which is not very sexy, to be <laughs> honest, but very important. This is an inscription, a Greek inscription, uh, that has been uh, collected by a Marquis de Nointel, the, the, Nointel, the Nointel Marquis, um, who was the ambassador of France in Constantinopolis. Uh, so he was representing uh, Louis XIV, the king's son, um, in the, the um, Ottoman Empire. And during his uh, embassy, he traveled around Greece and especially in Athens. And he was one of the first collector, uh, collectors of Greek marble uh, during this period of time with Lord Arundel for England. And he went back in France uh, with his collection uh, by authorization of the uh, into Ottoman Empire. And this inscription uh, has been uh, very famous right away because this is a list of Athenian citizens uh, um, who fall on the battlefield uh, for their city and um, during the fifth century BC. So for antiquarians, historian, it was one of the first historical inscription uh, published and um, there was a great deal of comment about it. So, um, of course, uh, this is not uh, the wing victory of Samothrace, but um, in the scholarship area, it's a very important uh, piece of marble. Next one, please. So we decided um, to undertake the conservation of, of this piece because um, we, are used, we were very used to this to his aspect, but it was not so readable. So, of course, with all the same precautions, uh, we went through this program. And maybe if, if and, you um, So the surface, as you can see, and underneath this line, this was uh, was dirty, dirty. And then on the top, I mean, you have uh, you have the first. Um, you you can see the the beginning of the cleaning. And um, the challenge on this uh, stila was that uh, there is some red pigment inside the letters. So um, it was um, the cleaning had to be done very carefully, not to, to clean the marble surface and not uh, take some of the pigment off. And also, this is a, a more, um, this is this stila has, has been made in pentelic marble which is a marble that has special uh, kind of an alteration, like uh, cracks, like here or like this one. And so it's um, the other uh, issue for this conservation treatment was to do some uh, consolidation of those cracks. And then, uh, you know, when the cracks go through the, um, the letters, uh, you have to, to hide it because uh, you have to first see the letters. So this is uh, during the treatment after cleaning and uh, after consolidation with um, infiltration of some resins inside the crack. And this is the same um, area after uh, infilling of the crack and uh, some inpainting of the, of the infillings. So you can you can see the surface and the inscription on the on the on the steel. Uh, next slide, please. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so here you see this um, Nointel inscription uh, 
before and after well to be honest my pictures are not very good especially before because it's a good picture before um, but um, when you are in front of the marble itself and i hope that uh, a good audience would be there during the fall if we can reopen our exhibitions all around the world you can see the difference and the Greek letters are much more readable, but on the other hand, as you see, you keep the story of the piece, you keep part of the cracks, you keep part of the losses. The idea is never to make um, to make old uh, antiquity and venerable uh, testimonia brand new, just to make it more enjoyable and readable uh, so that you can focus of, on what is interesting. You were, Anne was talking about dirt. Um, you, you have to understand that because maybe it's challenging to understand um, that a marble statue or a marble inscription uh, doesn't stay the same. Of course, it's marble, it's very solid, it's very resistant. But with time, the dust come on it, even, even though we undust mm. many times a year the marble. And plus the old, the previous conservation. conservation programs age, because now we use stable material, but during the 18th century, the 19th century, it was not the fact. So actually, if you, um, if you not, do not do something, at some, at some point, the piece is fading away a little bit because all those old treatments, plus the everyday life, as I could say, of uh, uh, of the museum um, makes um, the statue different. So that is why we are taking care of it. Uh, we could we could go on, but our time is running out. And if we want a little moment for questions, I think we should conclude uh, with this uh, with this inscription, which is not the wing victory of Samothrace or the Venus de Milo, but which is very important for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anne and Ludovic. That was fascinating. Um, of course, we have so many comments, so many questions. We're not going to be able to get to all of them, but let me see if I can pick out some good ones. I mean, they're all good, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, oh, this is a question. Oh, interesting. How is watercolor removed from marble? Doesn't the marble absorb the pigment? Well, this statue, there were um, one, two, three. The, the, the surface is not rough. So when the, those statues were just uh, polished, I mean, I mean, in the antique time, and the, the conservation of the marble is good. So uh, the watercolor will not go very deep inside the porosity of the marble. So you can always just take a, um, uh, a sponge and take it off, or you can, as, uh, as I did when I wanted to clean the statue, I used some pass that I left on the surface. And then if you leave, if you leave the pass to dry, this, this mix of um, water and paper pulp, if you leave it to dry, then it would absorb what it's in, inside the pro, the, the porosity of the marble. And then if you have a uh, watercolor, it will absorb the watercolor too. It's quite easy to remove actually. Yeah. And because, I mean, it's, it's a, when I said that I put some watercolor on the top of it, it's just like, it's basically nothing. I mean, um, it's just a little bit by small spots on the surface of the marble, so. Uh, this is a question from Athena. Were there any traces of original color found on the palace? No. Actually, besides this weird, uh, weird color, which seems to be modern, um, it was not possible to find original one. But this is why we, we keep the, the more we can, so that we can maybe uh, go further with other devices uh, later on. Um, question from John. 
what is known of the sculptor or sculptors of the winged victory monument and was a separate piece like the feather unusual or common in ancient Greece sculpture? Um, separated pieces uh, were common during uh, Greek antiquity, especially during this very period of time, which is the Hellenistic period, third century, first century BC. So, but in this case, this is haute couture. <laughs> this is a very, the, 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 the principle is well known during this period of time, but this is a very sophisticated way to do it, to achieve it. That is not common. Um, and the sculptor itself, there is a great deal of theories. Um, many of my colleagues previously thought we, we got the name, but actually, basically, to, be, to sum up, this is not signed on the base. You have no actual signature on the base. That would be useful, this is not the case. There is no antique sources, testimonia, historical testimonia. So basically, we deal with uh, clues and, and guesses. And each time, it's not provable. There was an article last year um, saying that it was absolutely this one. And with American colleagues uh, in the American Journal of Archaeology, which is the best uh, one in the world, we made a three. Um, or three-ended paper to say, well, actually, fair enough, but no, we don't know. And the title of the article was Keep the Record Straight. Like, don't invent things that we do not know. Right. We did it with Bonaway well, Scott, actually. Um, <clears throat> it's a good uh, um, uh, method to go by. Um, quite a few questions about the, the feather. Um, which I found extremely fascinating as well. Um, again, asking if there are any theories of why the feather was created separately in the first place. Oh, this is, this is a simple to answer this one. Because you have to understand that all those separate pieces were brought to some trace and then they build it up the, the sculptor who was uh, mastering all the process was with the team and he was building up the statue, you know, piece by piece. And at the end, you have to ring up the wings as the final thing that you put on the statue. So when you use, you know, those uh, strings. swaps, strings and swaps to ring up the to wings, lift. To, lift, to lift it, you can break it, especially if you have some extra further projecting from the general shape. So it's safer to lift up your wing and then to add the extra feather when it's safe so that you do not break all the projecting uh, parts. Okay. It's uh, practical. Well uh, we have time for maybe two more questions. Uh, one question from Theodora. How much were statues damaged because of restoration which was done in the 19th century? Well, the thing is that what was done in the 19th century, sometimes you can fix it, like extended uh, um, in fields that cover the surface and that you can remove or the in paintings because most of the times you can remove it also. In the 19th century, when it was decided to make a hole to fix two parts, this is something that we do not do anymore. Of course, the hole is done. You, you lost the material. And then, of course, nowadays you cannot do anything about it. It has been done in any museum all over Europe. You can find it in Britain, in Germany, in Italy, in France, in Greece. This is something to do the best you can do nowadays. Mm. This is something to misjudge 
what was done previously, when they did it, it was the common law everywhere. And they did it, they did it in, in um, I would say, in good faith. It is always tricky to judge nowadays what was done mm. by previous colleagues all around the museums and the archaeological sites, actually, uh, with um, their own perspective and, and technical uh, possibilities. Yeah, and so, oh, hmm? no, I just wanted to add that uh, now conservation works, they, there, is a, there are series, there are deontology, but then it, it, there is an evolution, like in any kind of, uh, of on subject. I mean, you, so of course, things were, they were done in the 19th century, they did it, as Ludovic said, in a good faith. And in a good faith, yeah. they, they just didn't. And now we just see, oh, we have new materials that we can, maybe we can do it otherwise. But uh, it's also the way that people would look at a statue in the 19th century that was, it was different than today's, because today you can, you can accept that a, a statue is missing a hand, is missing uh, but then in the 19th century, it was harder to, to accept it. And so people wanted to, to, to do some uh, restitution. To complete. To complete the statues, which is not For the instance. case anymore. Mm -hmm. Right. So there is a lot of evolution on, on all those ideas. And, the, and of course, in, uh, in one century or in two centuries, people will not work on the statues as we do now. As we do. Nowadays, what we do is that we can... We yeah, we do our best. As they with did. our best, as they did, but with our best, so that it can be changeable, changeable, mm. and reversible. In right. the 19th century, it was not an issue at stake because they did not have so many colloquium, symposium to talk mm. about it. Basically, so we can judge the previous possible damages, but we have to be very careful when we judge it. Mm. Right. Which I found fascinating. I mean, I wasn't aware of that at all. I mean, personally, I don't think you made any mistakes, mm -hmm. um, but it's mm -hmm. good. Uh, <laughs> it's good to know that that is a possibility and that is being done. Um, along those lines, I thought this was interesting. Are there people who are against restoration, so leaving it sort of in, a, in the pieces in their natural state? Yeah. Well, this is an interesting deba mm -hmm. debate, mm -hmm. but. And of course, as we, have, as we have said many times during this presentation, you don't clean it all mm. over. I mean, you keep the patina, you keep part of, of the aging. If uh, we wished, we would find the very color of the, mar of the marble as the mat material, it would be much brighter, actually. And yeah, we, we, I mean, I could have cleaned it and it could look much whiter than it does now, but uh, we, my colleagues and myself, we, we only use water. We didn't use any chemicals and uh, uh, we didn't use acids. We, didn't, we only use water. So just the past that I told you about, the one with the paper plug, mm -hmm. it's just that you can leave some water for a certain period of time on the surface. And so but there is nothing that's going to be harmful for the for the for the stone and uh, mm -hmm. um, but there is also another way to think about it most of the time people against conservation and why not i mean it's a free, it's a free, free world we mm -hmm. can we can share different opinions uh, do not realize that most of the very ancient pieces in major museums, major collection, had been restored many times mm. before. I mean, for instance, the royal collection of painting dating from Louis XIV, Louis XIV, and so on, all those painting would be in a very, very bad shape nowadays and very difficult to look at if they had not been restored during the 18th century and the 19th century. Basically, a piece of art is not a magic stuff. It's not a relica from God. This is material. And any kind of material as us ages with time. So it has a natural tendency to go back to the different chemicals that you put together to make a work of art. So when you don't do anything, a painting, for instance, go back to earth so it's very interesting to understand that 
So we have this topic, this, this issue with Leonardo da Vinci. How do you touch Leonardo da Vinci? Easy answer. Okay, we're going to do it carefully, but it has been done six times mm. before. And this is because it has been done before that you can see it today. Otherwise, it would, be, it would be in a very poor shape. So I'm not saying that this is ending the debate. A, a debate is saying it's, it, it's a good way to approach those type of topics. But it's very important to make it clear to the audience that it is not a, um, an alternative between never touch and we're going to touch it now. Right. Because it has been touched many times before, and this is probably the, the reason why this is still there. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to, make, to, 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 to sum up it in a very uh, easy way. Yeah. Um, well, and with that, I mean, I do hope we can see all these materials mm -hmm. soon. Come to <laughs> see you, come to see the masterpieces in all the wonderful museums. Mm -hmm. um, and I truly thank both of you, Ludovic and Anne, thank you for taking the time to talking thank with you. Me Thank you, thank you to invite us. Yeah. Thank you to invite us. Yeah. It was very Our amazing. pleasure, thank you for having us and it's a international audience uh so thank you for again for delighting us and bringing these true masterpieces into our homes and i hope to see you soon and mm -hmm. all the wonderful works of art again thank you so much thank you. Next time well, everyone more. wherever you are be well thank you thank you so much bye bye bye